Hello and good evening. My name is John. We're here playing uh, Blind Men. It's part of my Steam. There it is. Steam cleaning series with every game in my Steam library. Eventually, they'll arbitrarily rate and read them at the wheel to play time. I don't quite know what the game is, but the game is at random, but since it has a gallery, I have to assume that this is. Uh, they're kissing. This has got to be a, a, a visual novel. Let's hit start and find out together. Yeah. Sorry. Steam cleaning with every game in the Steam library. Eventually, arbitrarily rate and review. Pick the game at random. Um, Keegan. When I was seven, I was sent to live with my uncle. I had just lost my parents to a car accident. That's the same one that left the right side of my face disfigured. Disfigured? You look okay. Uh, he did his best to make me feel welcome, but it wasn't enough. Bullied by my peers and ignored by people that were supposed to help me. I didn't fit in anywhere. And I spent most of my childhood thinking that, that it was somehow all my fault. One day after I came home crying, my uncle pulled me aside and said to me, People are fools, Keegan, blinded by their own stupidity. They seek to destroy what they don't understand. But people like you and me, we're different. We're better. Never forget that. Uh, at that moment, it all became clear. I finally understood what I had to do. I followed my uncle's footsteps, and I'll show them. So what do you think? I'm only missing the essay section of the application. I don't know why the League, the, the league even asked for one. There's nothing particularly evil about good grammar. I laughed nervously at my own bad attempt at a joke. The League of Evil is the highest authority when it comes to criminal activity around the world. They can make or destroy supervillains' career with a single word, and even those that don't answer to them know better than to oppose them. Membership is for life, and vaccine... Oh, yeah. Vacancy, sorry. <laughs> Vacancies are rare and far and in between. Rare and far and... That's far and in between. Hmm. It's bad. Speaking of bad grammar. Even getting the opportunity to apply is difficult enough. Perfectly confident in my ability to deliver a flawless application, of course, but one can never be too sure. Which is exactly how I ended up asking one of my uncle's henchmen for his opinion on my application. Henchmen. It's about passion. Common criminals are a dime a dozen, and being a supervillain requires true dedication. He claps his hand together in excitement. He's almost as enthusiastic as I am about the idea of me getting to join the League, which makes the fact that I have no idea what his name is rather embarrassing. Not that I don't care, it's just that after a while, henchmen just sort of blend together. During training, we were shown the video of the boss's speech at the Allied Nations. It was wonderful. Half the room was in tears by the end of it. It's the one about how powerful countries abuse the voting system of the organization to legitimize their actions, isn't it? I've seen it too. It's really good. It's not for nothing that human resources make all the new recruits watch it. It's just a few words. You can really feel what the boss is about. What makes him different from all the other supervillains out there. You don't need to worry so much. Right from the heart and you'll do fine. Besides, you're Sphinx's nephew. It runs in the family. He said so himself, didn't he? I groan. Oh, don't even start. It's bad enough that people think I only got the opportunity because of him in the first place. The last thing I want is for it to actually be true. Getting to the league by my own merits is the only way I'll ever be taken seriously as a villain. By them, and by everyone else. Not to mention, he has this weird idea about how spending all my time down here is not good for me. And it's not something r recent either. Because intelligent agencies were always looking for my uncle. We never stayed too long one place. As a result, I was homeschooled for most of my life. But ever since I finished my high school studies three years ago, he's been trying to get me to enroll in college, an actual college with other normal people. At first, it was just subtle hints and the occasional comment, which I accepted as a way of showing he cared about my future. However, since last month, he's been bringing a bunch of pamphlets hope. He went as far as already telling me that if I was having problems choosing, I should study engineering like he did. Speaking so, you of the boss, when are you planning to tell him? I have managed to keep the application process secret for the better part of a year, but I can't remain that way forever. As proud as it makes me that he hasn't found out yet, I'm no fool. I know that luck has played at least some part in it. Besides, I mean it when I told the henchman that my uncle is the biggest inspiration, his approval would mean a lot to me. The next time I see him, I suppose, it'll be better if he hears it from me now and not from the league after I get accepted. He hates being left out and consider what I'm planning. He might just have a stroke. Well, here's your chance. He's heading our way. What? He was not supposed to come back until tonight. The henchman shrugs. I turn around and see my uncle walking through the door. He has never been a particularly expressive man, but he looks even more serious than usual. Good morning, boss. The henchman salutes him, and my uncle dispenses him with a nod. As he leaves, he silently mouths good luck in my direction. Raider. You're early. <clears throat> That's your dad? Okay. Looks like he's five years older than you. <clears throat> there was an explosion in the lab. There's toxic material everywhere, and since it will take time, take the cleanup crew a few hours to get rid of it, I tell everyone to go home for the day. I look down and notice that his clothes are stained with some kind of black substance. Instinctively, I take a step back. He looks down as well, shakes his head, and waves his hand in dismissive gesture. 
This is just oil. I was working on some of my old prototypes when I was informed of the explosion. Anything I can do help with, boss? No. I want to clear up some space in the storage room. I'll get rid of whatever I can't get in working condition. And how many times have I told you that you don't need to call me that? Sorry, I spend so much time with the henchmen. It rubs off after a while. Among other things. Uncle, really? That was years ago, and it only happened once. As far as I know, only because he got eaten by a shark before it could happen again. Hmm, yes. The time... The time the feeding cage malfunctioned and our perfectly trained shark decided to have him for lunch instead. What an unfortunate coincidence. The corner of his lips quirk up in an amused smile. I barely resist the urge to roll my eyes. Uh, you only have one, so you can only roll your eye. Uh, have you had time to go through the pamphlets? The entry exams begin next month, so you have to submit your papers as soon as possible. I spoke with Madame Mantis. She said that if you're interested in moving to America, she would happen to help you with anything you need. Ever since she retired, she has amassed quite a list of contacts in the Board of Education. In fact, if you get everything else ready before next Friday, she'll personally write you a recommendation letter. I met her a couple times. She was a proper villain, the kind of woman that never does things out of kindness of her heart. Meaning that he either asked her for a favor or she owed him one. Either way, I bet he's only telling me this, so I feel pressured into ruling. So, sometimes it shows me the Keegan when he's thinking, and other times it doesn't, and it puts the parentheses. Sometimes it does, and it puts parentheses. It's, it's odd that they're doing both. I'm glad that you brought it up, because I've been meaning to talk about talk with you about that. You have? Does it mean you've chosen a college already, then? Not exactly. Not exactly. Keegan, cut to today's. What if I didn't want to go to college? He stares at me in silence for what feels like an eternity. Finally, he closes his eyes and begins to rub his temples. We've been over this before. You need to do something with your life. You do a good job around here, but you can't keep running around with the henchmen forever. Wait, just hear me out. The reason I don't want to college is because... I want to become a supervillain just like you. In fact, I've already contacted the League. They think I've got a lot of potential, Uncle. They are just waiting for me to submit my full application. When did you even have time to do that? I... Save it. That's not important. Helping me out and being an actual supervillain are two completely different things. The League's application process is infamously hard for a reason, Keegan. Many people have died trying to impress the Council. Why do you even want to become one? Uncle, please. I've, got, I've gone through the curriculum of every major college in the world several times, actually. They've got nothing to teach me. I could go straight to the doctorate for about every field I'm interested in. Why should I waste my time with frivolities when I could be doing something that actually matters? You are the one that always says that people just don't know what's best for themselves. Well, I do. Besides, it's, it could just, it, maybe it'll work for us. It might just. Uh, besides, I've been helping, been helping you out practically my whole life. I'm not making an uninformed um, decision. I know exactly what I'm getting myself into. Are you sure about this? I've never been more sure about anything. Have you decided what you're going to call yourself? Do you have a base operations? What about a plan? How are you going to pay for everything? Do you remember the weapon dealer that sold you the parts we were missing for the death ray? Turns out that he also handles mercenary contracts and he comes highly recommended in that regard. He said that he would lend me one of his bases and some people if I went over a couple of blueprints of his scientists that were, his scientists were working on. I know it's not ideal, but it would only be for a day or two. After I'm accepted in the League, I'll have enough resources to get my own. He crosses his arms and another moment of silence. If you're, if you're serious about this, I won't be the one to stop you, but you're going to do this properly. Call the weapons dealer and tell him that you won't be needing his services anymore. You'll use my lair and my men. We'll draft a contract and if anybody asks, you rented them. Thank you, Uncle. I promise I won't disappoint you. Of course you won't. You'll be dead. Now, come, tell me more about your plan. A month later, location, National Museum of Science, Bonn, Germany. Oh, we're all fancy. Pretend to adjust the strand of my hair behind my ear, pressing the button in my earpiece to increase the volume. Henchman. Boss, I'm in the control room. I've taken care of the security recordings. The police won't find anything of use in any of them. Men are all in their posts and ready to go, too. They'll be waiting for, you, waiting for your signal. I'll stay here for a little longer to keep an eye on things. Please let me know if you understood. I nod. All right, see you in the auditorium, boss. As, aspiring super, as an aspiring supervillain, particularly one hoping to join the League, there are two things that to be taken into account when it comes to carrying out plans. Visibility and chance of success. Just like there's no point in doing something so uninspired that it barely makes it to the local news, there's no point in getting arrested on national television. Finding the balance is key, and that's exactly why I've chosen Bonn National Museum of Science as my target. It's a beautiful place, and just like its research center hosts many important scientists, Vault is home to a lot of rare and expensive equipment. Despite that, under normal circumstances, there wouldn't be anything particularly worth stealing here. But starting today, the museum will be hosting the Schultz Holt, Schultz Holt collection of rare minerals. Its, it's main piece being the famous uh, Engulag Diamond. 
Besides one of the largest cut precision stones known to man, its purity and chemical composition make it one of the most versatile energy conductors in the world. In addition to the exhibit itself, the museum board also invited Professor Schultz uh, to give a conference at the end of the inauguration party. Schultz is both a geologist and a political activist, and he's greatly respected in both fields. To make sure that no other villain interferes, I told both the League and my uncle that I'd be planting bombs in the museum and holding the guests hostage for a ransom. Very few people are willing to risk getting blown up by a first timer after all. But actually, my real plan is... Oh, I got a choice here. Well, I think we should steal the diamond. I don't want a person. That 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 gets tricky. Stealing it in Glog certainly won't give me any points for originality, so it, it's changed hands so many times that it's been authenticated every time. It has to be authenticated every time it shows up. But with so many important people here, a robbery is bound to get all the media attention I need, and then some. Besides, I can think of a thing or two that I can't... I can do with the diamond itself and the time it takes for me to find a buyer for it. It's a great plan. If I say so myself, my nerves don't kill me first, that is. Until Schultz's conference begin, there isn't much for me to do except for wait. The only reason I got here at the beginning of the inauguration in the first place was in case the henchmen need me for something. Unfortunately, that also means that I've had plenty of time to go over the plan in my head, including all the little details that could go wrong. I hate to admit it, but my uncle was right. Me and the mass of plan isn't just another per person helping out. Another person help is a completely different experience. But it doesn't matter, when I join the League, I'll get to tell the story whichever way I want. None of the boring parts, none of the doubts, everything was perfect on the first try. In the end, I decided to go grab a drink at the bar while I wait. The bar is actually more of a counter in one of the corners of the lobby in its own separate place. It's meant for people who want to get something to drink without having to find a place at one of the tables or wait for the servers to take their order. As I approach, the first thing I see is a man surrounded by a small group of people, most of them women. We should show this. We should show this. I can't get a good look at him for over here, but every once in a while, the whole group erupts in laughter. After the third or so time I think that happens, the bartender walks over from behind the counter and says something to them. He probably asked them to either lower their volume or leave, since the group began to disperse right afterwards. Now by himself, the man takes a seat next to another blonde man. He leans back on the chair and begins swinging it back and forth. Ooh! Is this, um, Squall from Final Fantasy VIII? No wonder he's from him. He's pretty handsome, and the man next to him isn't too bad himself either. Definitely a much better view than what I had at the lobby. The moment passes and the man in the tuxedo says something. They exchange a few words, but the expression on the blonde man's face is so unfriendly that they don't really go beyond that. It looks could kill. Oh, we're back. In any case, I don't have much time to think about it. Then at that moment, the first man turns around and our eyes meet. I look away to see if he'll do the same, but he doesn't. Instead, I can feel him staring at me until I give up and look back. He makes a gesture at the bartender to order another whatever he's having. Now, with additional glass in his hand, he approaches stopping right next to me and leaning against the counter. So we're back in here now. So this scene is taking place in the bar that they, they showed us the, the image for, but we're not actually in the bar for this part of the scene. So that's a little discordant. Hunter. Having fun? From his body language and his accent, I'd say he's American. I wave my hand in his missive manner. Not really. Watching the governor try to explain the merits of mineralogy has been the highlight of my evening so far. These things... These things are usually more lively, well, as lively as events of this sort can get. Last time there was Professor of Columbia. What was his name? Anyway, he's convinced that Schultz's mythology is faulty, so he always ends up causing a ruckus whenever they meet. This time, the committee made sure that guest list is inoffensive as possible. You didn't hear from me, of course. Of course. Drink? He raises the glass towards me. I saw him order it, but I didn't see the bartender pour it, so of course I'm not going to accept it. I shake my head and pick up my own glass, almost empty by now from the, from the counter. No, thank you. I already have one. He shrugs and takes a sip. Quite good, isn't it? German alcohol is one of the two reasons. German alcohol is... Eh, okay. One of the two reasons I'm glad that the Soviets only got to keep half the country. Okay, so we're... We're setting a time frame. We're, we're during the Cold War when there was East and West Germany. The other one is... Germans! And now it's become clear that he's flirting with me. Is it? Whenever he's actually going to do... Whether he's actually doing a good job is a different point altogether. I side to... Do we want to flirt with this guy? I mean, sure. All two can play the same game. Let's see if he can put his money where his mouth is. Of course, one of those things is much more fun than the other. He laughs, put down the glasses, and offers his free hand. I take it and give him a grin in return. The handshake lasts a couple of seconds, more than strictly necessary, and, he, and instead of simply letting go and end, he slides his fingers across my palm. Ooh... I curl my fingers slightly so that they interlock briefly at the end. 
That does it. He begins oogling me in what's possibly the least subtle manner known to man. Johns, it's a pleasure to meet you. Pleasure's all mine. Don't take this the wrong way, but you look kind of young for an academic. I'm still an under undergrad. I'm hoping for a chance to discuss my thesis with Souls before I submit it. Asking Souls for his opinion about an undergrad thesis, that's quite a high bar you set for yourself. Trust me, you don't even know the half of it. So, what's this about? In simple terms, I'm researching ways to improve the accuracy of the tools used to locate and harvest petroleum deposits. It would make extraction quicker, cheaper, and more environmental friendly. Right now, it's all theory, but I'm pretty sure that my calculations will lead to it being applicable. That's quite impressive. All the better for me. I like them smart. Whoa! You just said this kid looks young, and you're just still going at 110%? Like... I just... How, all right. With a grin, he puts the shan on my shoulder and leans closer until his face is practically touching mine. His breath feels hot against my ear, and mixed with the faint smell of alcohol coming from it, it's enough to send a shiver down my spine. Maybe we could discuss some of your ideas in private. I'm tempted, so very tempted. But if I miss Schultz, my thesis eyes would have my head. Take a step back, and he lets go of my arm. What a shame, but I understand. Next time, then. He picks up the glass, chugs it down, turns out the rest of the drink, and winks at me for turning around and walking away. As soon as he's out of my sight, I let out a sigh. What gall? If I had been anyone else, this could have been ended badly for him. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm not planning to see him again anytime soon. There's a buzzing sound from one of the nearby speakers, and I turn my attention to it. First call, proceed to take your seats. The conference will begin in 15 minutes. The announcement is done. I head towards the auditorium. Hey, new scene. Other than the first two roles, which have been reserved for politicians, the press, the seats aren't numbered. Terribly inconvenient for people who would rather secure a good place without having to enter early or wait too long in the line for it. On the other hand, it's perfect for someone who, like me, who'd rather have not have a name attached to their ticket. When one of the ushers take my ticket, I recognize him as one of my uncle's men, just like the henchman said. He directs me towards a free seat at the corner of one of the middle rows. Perfect. Nothing would ruin a dramatic entrance like having to ask people to stand up so I could get to the stage. Once I'm at the seat, it quickly becomes obvious why no one's taken it yet. Today next to me is the blonde man from the hall, reading the program with an expression on his face just unfriendly as one he had back there. Excuse me, is this seat taken? He looks at me, shakes his head, and goes back to reading without a single word. Under any other circumstances, I wouldn't care, but come on. You talk to their man at the bar, and I don't get more than a side glance. Look, you gotta stay focused, kiddo. Like, I know, I know you're hot to trot, but like, you're trying to steal a diamond. It's entirely possible for him to just be a regular guy with bad social skills and poor German. But he didn't even attempt to answer in English either. I decide to give my gut feeling a try and lean closer to him and lower my voice so that no one else will hear. I begin to speak to him in Russian. I've heard that Russians have a lot of trouble getting travel permits nowadays, even those who have never been to the Soviet Union. I can't even imagine how it must be for an actual Soviet to get out of their country. That gets his attention, enough to put down the program and turn to face me. He looks like he's assessing me and trying to intimidate me at the same time. If I'm completely honest with myself, why am I interested in talking with him? Yes, yes, good question. Um, there's something suspicious about him. It's not uncommon to find Russian expatriates uh, in high-profile events, but in general, they're pretty easy to recognize. This man isn't one. I think you could recognize this guy as suspicious. I went through a lot of trouble to make sure no one interrupted my today, so if there's something out of place about him, I need to know. Um, oh, this is still in Russian. Sergey. Me neither, but I imagine this is about as difficult as finding someone that will teach you Russian on the side of the world. His accent is very thick, even in Russian. Thankfully, I speak the language fairly well, otherwise I would have regretted my decision as soon as he opened his mouth. As with all things, it is a matter of knowing the right people speaking a language won't get you arrested, though. That depends on how you use it. And how do you use it? Who are you? No one of consequence, as long as you don't get in my way. Huh. We exchange a look at suspicion before he goes back to reading, not without hesitation. Seems like I'll have to keep an eye on him. Third call, please remain silent for the duration of the conference. I'd like to remind you that photography is restricted to authorized press. Lights of the room begin to dim until they turn off completely in the auditorium's only remaining illumination are the spotlights above the stage. A man in a suit appears to the left of the stage followed Professor Schultz. He stops at the podium and assumes any hopes of conversation are drowned out by the audience applause. Please welcome Professor Hans Schultz, head of the Schultz Holtz Schultz Holtz Foundation. I'm not saying that right. Another round of applause, this time much louder. After a couple of seconds pass, Holtz holds his hands up and the whole room goes quiet. Slowly, the floor next to him begins to open. Everyone watches all as the case in which the diamond is kept raises from it. I have seen pictures of it before, of course, but it doesn't compare to seeing it in person. As you all know, Inglung is the most rarest gemstones in the world. Flawless both in its surface and its interior, it allows both heat and electricity to be conducted with minimal dispersion up to... Press the button on the side of my watch. I couldn't risk bringing too much equipment on my person, but I managed to fit both the communicator and a small laser into my watch. 
Oh, we got some music picking in. At my signal, the doors burst open and the henchmen appear, while the other ones that have been posting ushers hurried, locked the back doors on. My uncle only ended up lending me about half a dozen of them, but since the people inside have no way to tell, there are more than enough. There are whispers and confusion at first, but the room goes completely quiet when Schultz slams his hands against the podium. What is the meaning of this? How can I get these people out of here? I stand up and I'm escorted to the stage by that one henchman whose name I should probably know by now. While we walk, he goes ahead and hands me the controller for the bombs. It's mostly for show since we only wired enough bombs to mess up some of the less important rooms slightly, while the rest are decoys set to release smoke. Of course, they don't know that. There has been a slight change of plans, Professor. As I take the podium, I put down the control in front of me and I signal the henchman to restrain Schultz. We both get off the stage and he leads the professor towards the side of the auditorium. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated. If you cooperate and do exactly as you're told, no one will get hurt. When you look back to this moment in a few years, you'll realize that it was the most important day of your lives. Scientific achievement, political careers, everything you've done will pale in comparison to the instant, this instant, and that is because today you'll become part of history. So the honor of witnessing the birth of one of the greatest supervillains known to man, Dr. Cyclops. Oh, jeez. As so of right now, you might, you might also have the honor of being my hostage. You actually you don't have a doctorate, so you're not really a doctor. Uh, honor of being my hostages. Hopefully the government values your lives. I'm briefly interrupted by the sound of a talking coming from amongst the seats. I sigh ignore it and continue. Enough to pay. When it happens again, I stop speaking and begin to look over the crowd, searching for the source of the interruption. Most of the guests have either look, fear, or discomfort on their faces, and some of them even shake their heads while they notice me looking at them. What do I have henchmen for if they can't keep people from talking at the same time as me? Finally, I notice the henchman is out of place, standing at the end of the row rather than his place next to Schultz. He seems to be arguing with someone. I step down from the stage to get a better look, and I recognize the other person as the man from the lobby. What are you doing? Sit down. I'm going to have to go into the bathroom unless you want me to get sick all over the floor. He stands up and takes a few steps forward. Actually, it's more of an awkward stumble. He looks really drunk. Hey, I said you aren't going anywhere. Benjamin grabs his arm to stop him. Suddenly, the man turns around and punches him square in the nose, knocking out cold in the process. Stepping around the henchman, unconscious body puts a hand inside his jacket and takes out a gun. At first, I'm amused by the idea of getting shot by an overeager drunk, but he manages to point it right at me just fine. Agent Hunter, Global, you're all under arrest. Oh, I should have known. Crap. People are beginning to turn to look at him, whispering to each other until the crowd's attention is divided between the two of us. Meanwhile, none of the henchmen move, unsure what to do. The only security on the site was supposed to be at the museum's guards and some of the local police station outside. There was nothing to make us think that an agent of global would be here, let alone armed. Henchmen could deal with him through sheer number alone, but I need to keep, keep control of the crowd. If everyone begins to panic, it's not going to be good for any of us. I decided to try and bluff, so I shrug and laugh it off. Nice try, but you wouldn't risk a shootout in a room full of civilians, or for me to blow this place sky high. Pick up the control and put my index finger on the big red button in the middle of it. See this? My men have put bombs all around the museum. One false move, and I'll push it. Are you still inside? No, I don't think so. As for your henchmen, my aim is pretty good, and something tells me none of them want to be the one that gets their boss shot. Just have to see who's faster. Get them. Henchmen are getting ready to fire when I'm blind by flash white light. When on the instinct, I drop the control and raise my arm to cover my good eye. The moment makes me lose balance and I'm falling back. Grenade! Everyone get down! Hold your fire. My vision blurred so much that I can barely see the second flash of light when it goes off. The people begin to scream, but the noise sounds distant as at the other room altogether. Not much of a relief, but at least that means that they were flash grenades rather than fragmentation ones. It takes a couple of seconds for my eyesight to come back completely and a couple more for me to regain enough strength to be able to stand up. I look around. Half the henchmen are on the floor, covering their ears in pain. The other half still look too confused to do anything. Upon realizing that no one is blocking their way anymore, the people in the seats begin to run towards the exits in panic, pushing each other and screaming. By the time the henchmen try to regain control of the situation, the whole room has descended into chaos. In front of me, Agent Hunter points his gun in my direction and begins to approach. At least he's trying to. His hand is shaking so much that he's obviously he's just as disoriented as I am. I frown. If it wasn't him, then who? He looks at me, and then the floor, and then stops. Look down as well and realize why. It's the control. He hurls himself forward as I gra and grabs it. I take the opportunity to kick the gun out of his hand, but he holds onto my leg and pulls me down with him. We both end up on the floor trying to wrestle the control out of each other's hands. While Agent Hunter may be strong, right now I'm the one in better condition, so I managed to hold my own against him. You keep rolling. You should really show some of this. You keep rolling around the floor until I manage to flip him over and pin him down. Have I never told you this is your best angle? Shut up and give it back. As we continue to struggle for the control, I notice something. Get on the stage out of the corner of my eye. Turn my head and see the blonde man from the lobby walk up to the diamond's case and lift it up. It's a brief distraction, but it's enough to give Hunter the upper hand he needs to push me off him. 
When I fall back, the control is sent flying into the air, and Hunter and I stare at it as it lands right on the detonator. Well, crap. Of course, nothing happens. It's a decoy, isn't it? Hunter shakes his head in disbelief, whipping up Edith swept from his brow with the back of his hand. But instead of looking angry, he seems rather amused by the whole situation. All right. Um, this is uh, Blind Men, which is kind of like a, a spy thriller, which I like, or super villain slash spy villain. Uh, I think it's pretty decent. Um, yeah. Fair number of choices. Uh, decent writing. Not enough screens, but that's the classic visual novel fair, I guess. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs>